James. Now remember something like this happened before. On the eve that Jesus was to be arrested, uh, tried several times, whipped, beat up beyond uh, physical recognition, and eventually uh, crucified on the cross when he was leaving the Last Supper from the Feast of the Passover that he held with his disciples. He left that place that they had that Last Supper with 11 disciples. Oh yeah, Minister Weatherby, wait a minute. Your, your, your arithmetic is off a little bit. I recall the Bible says that Jesus had 12. Yes, he did. One of the 12 was known as the son of perdition, the betrayer, Judas Iscariot. And at that particular time, Jesus had identified to Judas that he knew he was to betray him. He sent Judas on his way to go over to the chief priest, uh-huh, uh, the religious rulers of that day, and to make that transaction, to, to, to complete that transaction that he had agreed to enter in with them to a betrayal our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ G Judas had went on his way Jesus took the 11 remaining and as he was walking with them he dropped off, the, off 8 of them and he took these 3 people Peter, James and John that's the three. That's the that's the uh, two sons of Zebedee, and that's what Jesus did. He started with 11, twelve. He ended up with eleven, but he dropped it down to three. It don't take. It does not take a crowd to do the work of God. Now we're moving on, as we see in the scriptures again. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, that 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 uh, thirty-eighth verse. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion, weeping and wailing. And I make a note right here when I was speaking this morning, I've spoken about this before, in particular dealing with the death of Lazarus, when people were wailing and crying and all that other manner of, of going on. You know how people are when people die. Well, in the Jewish custom, they had a tradition. They paid mourners. They paid people to weep and wail on behalf of the family. So what am I saying? All what I'm saying is all this commotion, weeping and wailing that was going on, you would think it would be for uh, the uh, uh, Jairus' daughter that had died. No, it wasn't. These people ain't had no real connection to him. They probably ain't cared nothing about him. They were being paid. They were being paid. And then watch what Jesus did. He went in, uh, inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. Now watch the response. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave. And he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. That's why it don't take a crowd to do the work of God. And you know, you need to know this, that like I said this before, just because you have great numbers of folks that say that they are with you. As a matter of fact, I'm noting this because, oh my God, we sent out a message. We sent out a call to anybody that wanted to be a part of this ministry tonight. I did it earlier this morning. I, 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 I did reminders uh, earlier this evening, and I did one just a little while ago. Matter of fact, all I did was call for 10 of coming from both pages, my wife's Facebook page and my Facebook page. It just had to be a total of 10 that were willing to be a part of this ministry. And there's over hundreds of people that, that say that they are friends on Facebook. But let me tell you, everybody that say they are with you ain't really with you. No, they're not. And that's just the truth anyhow. And it's all and it's supported by the word of God. I'm going to show you an illustration of this because you really need to understand sometimes that it don't take a crowd of people. Too many of us believe that it, we got to have a crowd. We got to have numbers of folks to show that they support us. They love us. Yeah, everybody ain't supporting you and everybody ain't loving you. That I can tell you in accordance to what I know. Uh, uh, but I also can tell you in accordance to what I've seen in the word of God. Let us go. Let us go to Job, the second chapter, and pick it up at verse 11. When three of Job's friends heard of the tragedy he had suffered, they got together and traveled from their homes to comfort and console him. That was their mission. Their names were Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite. When they saw Job from a distance, they scarcely recognized him. Wailing loudly, they tore their robes and threw dust into the air over their heads to show their grief. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and nights. No one said a word to Job, for they saw that his suffering was too great for words. That sounds real noble. That sounds like true friends. Until you go to that fourth chapter. Uh-huh. The third chapter, Job tried to have a conversation, uh, speak to God in a way that he knew how uh, over his situation. But watch what happens in the fourth chapter, and I won't go no further than that. 
um, uh, the, a couple of the verses from there. I want I want you to see something about a crowd and so-called friends. Then Eliphaz, the Temanite, replied to Job, Will you be patient and let me say a word? For who could keep from speaking out? Yeah, Lord have mercy. Oh, my God. Hey, you know, be, be, be with people. When you hear people say something like this, Oh, child, I'm so sorry, but I just can't help myself. I have got to say this to you. I have got to tell you that. I'm here to tell them people, no, you don't got to say anything. You ain't got to tell nobody nothing, especially if what you telling them ain't edifying them. Because if all you got to do is speak negativity into somebody, you keep that to yourself. Amen. I say this and I, and I say it was all earnest before I got saved. I had this I had this here understanding that if anybody come to me under the guise of encouragement and within five words out of their mouth, I hear something. I hear something negative. If I hear something negative. I will, Lord have mercy, the devil is a liar. If I hear something negative, I will absolutely step back from them because they have no, they have no good intentions for me at all. That's what I want you to know. And watch what Eliphaz did here. In, will you be patient and let me say a word for who could keep from speaking? In the past, you have encouraged many people. You have strengthened those who were weak. Your words have supported those who were falling. That sounds good. You encourage those with shaky knees. But here's where he comes in at him. But now, when trouble strikes, you lose heart. You are terrified when it touches you. Doesn't your reverence for God give you confidence? You know that old sarcastic, oh my God, I almost said something. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Doesn't your life of integrity give you hope? He was mocking Job. Why was he mocking Job? Because in the first chapter, the word of God came forth and said there was a man living. Oh, let me read it. Oh, Lord God Almighty. I tell you, you know, <laughs> there was once a man named Job who lived in the land of us. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. That's what people hated. That's what people hated. And if that wasn't bad enough, watch this. Mm-hmm. As we move down into the sixth verse of that first chapter, one day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord and the accuser Satan came with them because he has access, y'all. Many people always may question, what in the world was Satan doing up there with the members of the heavenly court, the angels, the sons of God? Y'all have to understand something. God, God created everything and everybody. Satan is a creation of God. And before he was known as Satan, he was Lucifer. He was a part of the heavenly court. He was a part of the heavenly court. He was a cherubim, one of those ministering angels. And he had a position that we understand that was akin to being a choir director. Amen. He did not look, he does not look like that. those depictions that we've seen in the movies and, and all those other things, the pictures and images and things that, they have, that we have drafted in our minds of Satan. That ain't how the Bible describes him. And just like uh, 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 the sons of God and us, Satan has to give an account of what he's doing in his person. That's why he appears before God. He appears before God daily. But he just don't come up there and tell God what he's doing. He's up there accusing. That's why he's known as the accuser. And where, the, where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. The devil is a liar. He told part of what he's doing. The Bible says he goes to and fro on the earth, watch, uh, 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 seeking whom he may devour. That don't seem to be mentioned here. But that's all right. We serve an omniscient God. He knows all things. We don't have to tell God everything. It would be nice if you tell him everything. But know this. He already knows your thoughts from afar off. He knows your thoughts before they enter into your mind. And this is what happened. This is how I know this to be true. I don't, When I say stuff like this, y'all, I ain't just coming up with some nice Arthurism. Watch what God, watch what God said to Satan uh, 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 after Satan said that he was uh, watching everything that's going on, walking, patrolling the earth. Then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blamed as a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. The reason why I wanted to get to that scripture is because of, of what Eliphaz said uh, about Job uh, uh, in that uh, uh, in that fourth chapter. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Uh, 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 in that fourth chapter, and he talks about him in the yeah. 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 
the, the sixth verse, doesn't your reverence of God give you confidence? Doesn't your life of integrity give you hope? Yeah, God spoke about Job as being a man of integrity. God had bragged on Job to the devil. And Job was known in the region that he lived as a man that was blameless and upright, that had the favor of God upon his life. These friends of his, they did not have that. I, I, will, guarantee, I will guarantee you they did not have that. I can tell by the tone that is being spoken in these words that they had and that they've been sitting around waiting, waiting for the opportunity to see Job fall. As soon as he did, they came and did something that's so you got to watch people. You got to watch those folks that come up on you and say that they with you. What what the what Joe's what Joe's friends did to give the appearance that they was with God, Job. They saw him, saw his situation, and they went through the same thing Job did. They rent their clothes, they put ashes all over their head to act like they was with him. They got down there where he was for seven days they were with him. Didn't say anything because they saw he was going through much distress. Then after Job woke up from that and started talking to the Lord, they jumped him, and that's where Eliphaz starts to challenge him with these sarcastic remarks. Uh-huh. Doesn't your life of integrity give you hope? Stop and think. Do the innocent die? Who have the upright? When have the upright been destroyed? So what is he saying? You couldn't have been what, what, what we know you to be or what has been spoken about you. Even God that brags on you, you can't be all of that, because if that was the case, why is this happening to you? That's why, that's why God separated, God separated, uh, uh, Jesus Christ separated all, he got rid of that crowd, he got rid of all of those folks, because what you don't need in times of distress, in times of a need, you don't need no, no folks that ain't got no good intention for you whatsoever hanging around you. I don't care what they're doing, weeping, wailing, and all that other kind of stuff. They clearly did not have the same mind that you had about the situation. They, as a matter of fact, uh, Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter and James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue, I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna read that again uh, uh, for your for just for effect. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader Jairus, saw much commotion, weeping and wailing. He went home inside and asked. Why all this commotion weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. Here's the response of the crowd. The crowd laughed at him. The crowd laughed at him. And then Jesus, he dealt with them, but he made them all leave. And he took the girl's father and the mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. You only need, you only need around you those that are really actually with you, that really only have a grave concern for you. You really don't need, and I know that we have this tendency to want to have large numbers of people around us because we get some form of sense of security. But let me tell you this, you can have false security as opposed to uh, uh, us really security. And a false sense of security is when you got too many people around you that really ain't got no love for you whatsoever. And when the times of trial, trouble, tests and tribulations and, 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 and things come up against you, you'll find out how many of those people are with you because when stuff starts to happen, you look around you and see how many people are standing with you. Lord have mercy. Don't take a crowd to do the work, God's work. Uh, but he made them all leave and he took the girl's father and mother and, and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying, holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha Kohum, which means little girl, get up. Amen. Whatever it is that we want to do um, that will bring forth the supernatural power of God, we need to speak in a manner that God will understand. And one manner that he does understand, and he tells us this in the word, that all we need to do, we don't need to know the heavenly language. We don't even know, even know the Jewish language because this was Jewish that he spoke to her, a Hebrew. Amen. We need, whatever we do, we need to say, in the name of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says that whatsoever we ask, we ask in his son's Christ Jesus' name, he will provide. He will absolutely respond to Jesus Christ because that's who he recognizes. Oh, he knows us. The very hairs on our heads are numbered, but he knows us better through Jesus Christ. Because but what God knows of us, that we are a wicked people. We are a sinful people. And if it had not been for the blood of Jesus, if it had not been for the blood of Jesus, 
none of us would be able to have access, true access to God. Because when God looks at us, he don't look to, uh, to, through, uh, to us, or when God looks at us, he does not look at us through our own righteousness. Matter of fact, we have no righteousness. Self-righteousness that we had, the Bible says, is as filthy rags. But he looks at us through the righteousness of his son, Christ Jesus, who died on Calvary's cross. Matter of fact, he just didn't die. He laid down his life on Calvary cross so that we might have a right to the tree of life. John 3.16 said, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That